Hi guys, we are here for our Bible in a Year Challenge reading and we are on May 22nd. That is going to come from 1 Kings 7-8, through 8, Psalms 65, and Romans 1. So 1 Kings chapter 7, Solomon builds his palace. Solomon also built a palace for himself and it took him 13 years to complete the construction. One of Solomon's buildings was called the Palace of the Forest of Lebanon. It was 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. The great cedar ceiling beams rested on four rows of cedar pillars. It had a cedar roof. It had a cedar roof supported by 45 rafters. It rested on three rows of pillars, 15 in each row. On each of the side walls, there were three rows of windows facing each other. All the doorways were rectangular in frame. They were in sets of three facing each other. He also built the Hall of Pillars, which was 75 feet long and 45 feet wide. There was a porch at its cover, covered by, there was a porch at its front, covered by a canopy that was supported by pillars. There was also the Hall of the Throne, also known as the Hall of Judgment, where Solomon sat to hear legal matters. It was paneled with cedar from floor to ceiling. Solomon's living quarters surrounded a courtyard behind this hall. They were built the same way. He also built similar living quarters for Pharaoh's daughter, one of his wives. All these buildings were built entirely from huge, costly blocks of stone cut and trimmed to exact measure on all sides. Some of the huge foundation stones were 15 feet long and some were 12 feet long. The costly blocks of stone used in the walls were also cut to measure and cedar beams were also used. The walls of the great courtyard were built so that there was one layer of cedar beams after every three layers of hewn stone, just like the walls of the inner courtyard of the Lord's temple with its entrance foyer. Furnishing to the temple. King Solomon then asked for a man named Hiram to come from Tyre, for he was a craftsman skilled in bronze work. He was half Israelite since his mother was a widow from the tribe of Naphtali, and his father had been a foundry worker for Tyr, from Tyre, so he came to work for King Solomon. Hiram cast two bronze pillars, each 27 feet tall and 18 feet in circumference. For the tops of the pillars, he made capitals of molded bronze, each 7.5 feet tall. Each capital was decorated with seven sets of lattice work and interwoven chains. He also made two rows of pomegranates that encircled the lattice work to decorate the capitals over the pillars. The capitals on the columns inside the foyer were shaped like lilies and they were six feet tall. Each capital on the two pillars had 200 pomegranates in two rows around them, beside the rounded surface next to the lattice work. Hiram set the pillars at the entrance of the temple, one toward the south and one toward the north. He named the one on the south Jacket and the one on the north Boaz. The capitals on the pillars were shaped like lilies, and so the work of the pillars was finished. Then Hiram cast a large round tank 15 feet across from rim to rim. It was called the sea. It was 7.5 feet deep and about 45 feet in circumference. The sea was encircled just below its rim by two rows of decorative gourds. There were about six gourds per foot all the way around, and they had been cast as part of the tank. The sea rested on a base of 12 bronze oxen, all facing outward. Three faced north, three faced south, three faced west, and three faced east. The walls of the sea were about three inches thick, and its rim flared out like a cup and resembled a lily blossom. It could hold about 11,000 gallons of water. Haram also made ten bronze water carts, each six feet long, six feet wide, and four and a half feet tall. They were constructed with side panels braced with crossbars. Both the panels of the crossbars were decorated with carved lions, oxen, and cherubim. Above and below the lions and oxen were wreath decorations. Each of these carts had four bronze wheels and bronze axles. At each of the corners of the cart were supporting posts for the bronze basins. These supports were decorated with carvings of wreaths on each side. The top of each cart had a circular frame for the basin. It projected one and a half feet above the cart's top like a round pedestal, and its opening was two and one-fourth feet across. It was decorated on the outside with carvings of wreaths. The panels of the carts were, round, were square, not round. Under the panels were four wheels that were connected to the axles that had been cast as one unit with the cart. The wheels were two and a half, one fourth feet in diameter and were similar to chariot wheels. The axle spokes, rims, and hubs were all cast from molten bronze. There were supports at each of the four corners of the carts, and those two were cast as one unit with the cart. Around the top of each cart, there, were, there was a rim nine inches wide. The supports and side panels were cast as one unit with the cart. Carvings of trubum, lions, and palm trees decorated the panels and supports wherever there was room and there were wreaths all around. All ten water carts were the same size and were made alike, for each was cast from the same mold. Haram also made ten bronze basins, one for each cart. Each basin was six feet across and could hold 220 gallons of water. He arranged five water carts on the south side of the temple and five on the north side. The sea was placed at the southeast corner of the temple. He also made the necessary pots, shovels, and basins. So at last Haram completed everything King Solomon had assigned him to make for the temple of the Lord, two pillars. Two bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars. Two networks of chains that decorated the capitals. Four hundred pomegranates that hung from the chains on the capitals. 
two rows of pomegranates for each of the chain networks that were hung around the capitals on top of the pillars. The ten water carts holding the ten basins, the sea and the twelve oxen under it, the pots, the shovels, and the basins. All these utensils for the temple of the Lord that Hiram made for Solomon were made of burnished bronze. The king had them cast in clay molds in the Jordan Valley between Succoth and, and Zarathon. Solomon did not weigh all the utensils because there were so many. The weight of the bronze could not be measured. So Solomon made all the furnishings of the temple of the Lord. The gold altar, the gold table for the bread of the presence, the gold lampstands, five on the south and five on the north, in front of the most holy place, the flower decorations, lamps and tongs, all of gold, the cups, lamps, snuffers, basins, dishes, and fire pans, all of pure gold, the doors for the entrances to the most holy place in the main room of the temple, with their fronts overlaid with gold. So King Solomon finished all his work on the temple of the Lord. Then Solomon brought all the gifts from his father David that had all the gifts his father David had dedicated the silver, the gold, and all the other utensils, and he stored them in the treasuries of the Lord's temple. Chapter 8, the ark brought to the temple. Solomon then summoned the leaders of all the tribes and families of Israel to assemble in Jerusalem. They were to bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from its location in the city of David, also known as Zion, to its new, new place in the temple. They all assembled before the king at the annual festival of shelters in early autumn. When all the leaders of Israel arrived, the priests picked up the ark. Then the priests and Levites took the ark of the Lord along with the tabernacle and all its sacred utensils and carried them up to the temple. King Solomon and the entire community of Israel sacrificed sheep and oxen before the ark in such numbers that no one could keep count. Then the priests carried the ark of the Lord's covenant into the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and placed it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the ark, forming a canopy over the ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the front entrance of the temple's main room, the holy place, but not from outside it. They are still there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed there at Mount Sinai, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel as they were leaving the land of Egypt. As the priests came out of the inner sanctuary, a cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their work because the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. Solomon blesses the people. Then Solomon prayed, O Lord, you have said that you would live in thick darkness. But I have built a glorious temple for you, where you can live forever. Then the king turned around to the entire community of Israel, standing before him, and gave this blessing. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept the promise he made to my father David. For he told my father, From the day I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have never chosen, chosen a city among the tribes of Israel as a place where a temple should be built to honor my name. But now I have chosen David to be king over my people. Then Solomon said, My father David wanted to build this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord told him, It is right for you to want to build the temple to honor my name. But you are not the one to do it. One of your sons will build it instead. And now the Lord has done what he promised. For I have become king in my father's place. I have built this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And I have prepared a place there for the ark, which contains the covenant that the Lord made with our ancestors when he brought them out of Egypt. Solomon's Prayer of Dedication. Then Solomon stood with his hands lifted toward heaven before the altar of the Lord in front of the entire community of Israel. He prayed, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in all of heaven or earth. You keep your promises and show unfailing love to all who obey you and are eager to do your will. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. You made that promise with your own mouth, and today you have fulfilled it with your own hands. And now, O Lord, God of Israel, carry out your further promise to your servant David, my father. For you said to him, If your descendants guard their behavior as you have done, they will always reign over Israel. Now, O God of Israel, fulfill this promise to your servant David, my father. But will God really live on earth? Why, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Listen to my prayer and my request, O Lord, my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is making to you today. May you watch over this temple both day and night, this place where you have said you would put your name. May you always hear the prayers I make toward this place. May you hear the humble and earnest requests from me and your people of Israel when we pray toward this place. Yes, hear us from heaven where you live and when you hear, forgive. If someone wrongs another person and is required to take an oath of innocence in front of the altar of this temple, then hear from heaven and judge between your servants, the accuser and the accused. Punish the guilty party and acquit the one who is innocent. If your people Israel are defeated by their enemies because they have sinned against you, and if they turn to you and call on your name and pray to you, here in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive their sins to return them to this land you gave their ancestors. If the skies are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and then they pray toward this temple and confess your name and turn from their sins because you have punished them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them to do what is right and send rain on your land that you have given to your people as their special possession. 
If there is a famine in the land, or plagues, or crop disease, or attacks of locusts, or caterpillars, or if your people's enemies are in the land besieging their towns, whatever the trouble is, and if your people offer a prayer concerning their troubles or sorrow, raise your hands toward this temple, raising their hands toward this temple, then hear from heaven where you live and forgive. Give your people whatever they deserve, for you alone know the human heart. Then they will live. Then they will fear you and walk in your ways as long as they live in the land you gave to our ancestors. And when foreigners hear of you and come from distant lands to worship your great name, for they will hear of you and of your mighty miracles and your power. And when they pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven where you live and grant them what they ask of you. Then all the people of the earth will come to know and fear you, just as your own people Israel do. They too will know that this temple I have built bears your name. If your people go out at your command to fight their enemies, and if they pray to the Lord toward this city that you have chosen, it toward this temple that I have built for your name, then hear their prayers from heaven and uphold their cause. If they sin against you, and who has never sinned, who has never sinned, you may become angry at them and let their enemies conquer them and take them captive to a foreign land far or near. But in that land of exile, they may turn to you again in repentance and pray. We have sinned, done evil, and attacked wick and acted wickedly. Then if they turn to you with their whole heart and soul and pray toward the land you gave to their ancestors, toward this city you have chosen, and toward this temple, I have built on your name. Then hear their prayers from heaven where you live. Uphold their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Make their captors merciful to them, for they are your people, your special possession, whom you brought out of the iron, smelting, the iron smelting furnace of Egypt. May your eyes be open to my requests and to the requests of your people Israel. Hear and answer them whenever they cry out to you. For when you brought our ancestors out of Egypt, O sovereign Lord, you, did, you told your servant Moses that you had separated Israel from among all the nations of the earth to be your own special possession. The Dedication of the Temple When Solomon finished making these prayers and requests to the Lord, he stood up in front of the altar of the Lord where he had been kneeling with his hands raised toward heaven. He stood there and shouted this blessing over the entire community of Israel. Praise the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the wonderful promises he gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never forsake us. May he give us the desire to do his will in everything and to obey all the commands, laws, and regulations that he gave our ancestors. And may these words that I have prayed in the presence of the Lord be before him constantly, day and night, so that the Lord our God may uphold my cause and the cause of his people Israel, fulfilling our daily needs. May people over all the earth know that the Lord is God and that there is no other God. And may you, his people, always be faithful to the Lord our God. May you always obey his laws and commands just as you are doing today. Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices to the Lord. Solomon sacrificed peace offerings to the Lord, numbering 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. And so the king and all Israel dedicated the temple of the Lord. That same day the king dedicated the central area of the courtyard in front of the Lord's temple. He offered burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of peace offerings there, because the bronze altar in the Lord's presence was too small to handle so many offerings. Then Solomon and all Israel celebrated the festival of shelters in the presence of the Lord their God. A large crowd had gathered from as far away as Lebo Hamath in the north in the north to the brook of Egypt in the south. The celebration went on for fourteen days in all, seven days for the dedication of the altar and seven days for the festival of shelters. After the festival was over, Solomon sent the people home. They blessed the king as they went, and they were all joyful and happy because the Lord had, had been good to his servant David and to his people Israel. Okay, and then Psalm 65. Okay, for the choir director, a psalm of David, a song. What mighty praise, O God, belongs to you in Zion. We will fulfill our vows to you, for you answer our prayers. And to you all people will come. Though our hearts are filled with sins, you forgive them all. What joy for those you choose to bring near, those who live in your holy courts. What joy awaits us inside your holy temple. You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds, O God our Savior. You are the hope of everyone on earth, even those who sail on distant seas. You formed the mountains by your power and armed yourself with mighty strength. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves and silenced the shouting of the nations. Those who live at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your wonders. From where the sun rises to where it sets, you, you inspire shouts of joy. You take care of the earth and water it, making it rich and fertile. The rivers of God will not run dry. They provide a bountiful harvest of grain, for you have ordered it so. 
You drenched the plowed ground with rain, melting the clods and leveling the ridges. You softened the earth with showers and blessed its abundant crops. You crowned the year with a bountiful harvest. Even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. The wilderness becomes a lush pasture and the hillsides blossom with joy. The meadows are clothed with flocks of sheep and the valleys are carpeted with grain. They all shout and sing for joy. In Romans chapter 1. Greetings from Paul. This letter is from Paul, Jesus Christ's slave, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. This good news was promised long ago by God through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It is the good news about his son Jesus, who came as a man, born into King David's royal family line. And Jesus Christ our Lord was shown to be the Son of God when God powerfully raised him from the dead by the means of the Holy Spirit. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them, so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. You are among those who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ, dear friends in Rome. God loves you dearly, and he has called you to be his very own people. May grace and peace be yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God's good news. Let me say, first of all, that your faith in God is becoming known throughout the world. How I thank God through Jesus Christ for each one of you. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by telling others the good news about his son. One of the things I always pray is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. For I long to visit you so I can share a spiritual blessing with you that will help you grow strong in the Lord. I am eager to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. In this way, each of us will be a blessing to the other. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I have planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see good results, just as I had done among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in our culture and to people in other cultures, to the educated and the uneducated alike. So I'm eager to come to you in Rome, too, to preach God's good news. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, Jews first and also Gentiles. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. God's anger at sin. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who push the truth away from themselves. For the truth about God is known to them instinctively. God has put this knowledge in their hearts. From the time the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky and all that God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. Yes, they know God. They knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. The result was that their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they become utter fools instead. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshipped idols made to look like mere people or birds and animals and snakes. So God let them go ahead and do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Instead of believing what they knew was the truth about God, they deliberately chose to believe lies. So they worshipped the things God made, but not the Creator Himself, who is to be praised forever. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relationships with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men and as a result suffered within themselves the penalty they so richly deserved. When they refused to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their evil minds and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, fighting, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They are forever inventing new ways of sinning and are disobedient to their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, and are heartless and unforgiving. They are fully aware of God's death penalty for those who do these things, yet they go right ahead and do them anyway. And worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. True story. Okay, that is all for today's reading. We'll see you next time.